Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. I'm sorry, we're ringing uh, 10 minutes late. I do mind of time. And thank you very much for coming before lunchtime. We all know uh, it's uh, very competitive at lunch. Uh, so we want to finish exactly on time. Um, the workshop is number 118. Uh, its title is Law Enforcement uh, Through Domain Names, the Caveats to DNS Neutrality. I, so we will be talking about some interesting things, the nuances between law and domain name system. Um, hopefully it is interesting to you. Today we have a very distinguished panel uh, from my left. Uh, we have a dear friend from Russia, is dot RU, CCTLD manager, Andrei. <laughs> right, and um, we have uh, Carlos Afonso, is a young professor from Brazil. <laughs> Even his young is very famous. And we have two professors from India, is uh, Professor Vivekananda and Professor Chingli. And at my far left, <laughs> uh, there's Bertram from France. What you can see is very interesting setting. I'm from China. My name is Hongxu. It looks like a brick country plus Bertram. <laughs> so we, we have a um, uh, Brazil, Indian, um, uh, Russia, China. Uh, the drone probably can represent the rest of the world, <laughs> right? Uh, so hopefully we have some interesting discussion today. Uh, before my uh, opening uh, little talk, I would like all my dear friends to give a short self-introduction, probably in three sentences each. <laughs> so Andre, how about from you? Uh, uh, thank you, Hong. Uh, my name is Andre Kolesnikov. Um, I'm a director of uh, Russian uh, CCTLD, uh, and we operate two uh, country code domain names, uh, .ru, which is about 4 million domain names, and .rf, which is IDN, national IDN, which is about 860,000 domain names. Uh, and we face with these issues we're going to discuss today, every day. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Carlos and Fonso, please. So, hi everyone, I'm Carlos Afonso from Getulio Vargas Foundation in Brazil. I'm the Vice Director of the Center for Technology and Society, not to be mistaken with the Center for Internet and Society, from uh, my friends at the table. Uh, <laughs> one is in India, the other one is in Brazil. And uh, I think uh, my participation here is due to the well, we are centered inside a law school at the Tulio Vargas Foundation, so we have been following internet governance for a while, and nowadays we have a partnership with the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee to develop a permanent analysis of the, the developments of Brazilian internet. So I'll be talking a little bit about some, some recent cases and, and some, some developments on the Brazilian internet. So I think that's it. Thank you. Vivek, please. I am uh, Vivekanandan. I teach at uh, National Academy of Legal Studies and Research at Hyderabad in India. I am also the director of the Global Internet Governance and Advocacy Think Tank, uh, which interacts with civil society as well as government. And uh, finally, I am not a young professor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vivek. Chinmay, please. Thank you. I am Chinmay Arun. I am an assistant professor at National Law University, Delhi. I'm also a fellow of the Center for Internet and Society, and um, I'm involved in setting up a Center for Communication Governance, which would, um, which would generate quite a lot of research, build capacity around uh, media and internet policy, and which would hopefully also get involved with a little bit of policy intervention. Thank you. Bertrand? Good morning. I'm Bertrand de La Chapelle. I'm on the board of directors of uh, ICANN. I am also directing a internet and jurisdiction project which deals with issues like the ones that we are talking about today. We will organize, by the way, two um, other workshops that I will talk more about it. I was previously the French ambassador for uh, information society dealing with those uh, issues. 
and one of the activities of the program I run was to organize at the CIS in Stanford, the Center for Internet and Society of Stanford, a workshop on some of those issues. Thank you very much for your kind introduction to yourself. It's really impressive. For me, uh, my name is Hong Xie. I'm a law professor of Beijing Normal University, director of Institute of Internet Policy and Law. I'm also faculty chair of Asia Pacific Internet Leadership Project. It's a capacity building project on internet governance in Asia Pacific region. And let's go to our uh, topic we're going to talk about today. It's about law enforcement uh, through DNS. What is it? Uh, we, we have been seeing uh, the law enforcement on the internet for many years. It's from the day one of internet. There's a lot of legal issues that's happening here. It's about privacy, uh, defamation, cybercrime, intellectual property infringement. All these things just are uh, happening on the internet and the law enforcement agency are using all the mechanism to address these issues. One of the mechanism is through the internet service providers. They can ask the ISP to take down certain contents, uh, to block certain traffics, uh, to prevent the cybercrime, to protect the, uh, the, the uh, privacy or personal data, uh, protect intellectual property rights. This has become very much uh, regular of various legal practices in most of the countries. Uh, for example, as with respect to copyright, uh, we've seen from the United States Digital Millennial Copyright Act, DMCA, this notice and takedown mechanism has been used very widely all around the world. So in almost all the jurisdiction, uh, major jurisdiction in the world, we can see the ISP will take action, take down certain contents, either through court order or according to their own policies. But what we can see is happening recently and is pretty new now is kind of enforcement through the domain name system. This is raised tremendous concern in the internet community. Uh, if you are going to enforce through deep and down into the critical internet resources, apart from the uh, internet service provider's level, uh, they will possibly uh, affect the internet traffic, affect the stability and the security of internet communication. This is being addressed very clearly by the technical experts on the internet. And we're saying there are many countries or international organizations actually making rules or norms this is going to this direction. Despite the opposition from the internet community, what we learn is the bill from the United States, such as on SOPA or PIPA, uh, that's kind of through DNS filtering. You either block the domain name, stop the resolution, or redirect the domain name to another size. This is the same as a direct uh, 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 intervention with the internet traffic. This has been happening in the GTLD namespace for quite some time. And there's a lot of discussions, and eventually, because of social pressure uh, in, from the whole world, uh, the internet blackout day, uh, these two bills didn't go anywhere. It was not approved at the US Congress. But of course, this is not end of story. We know the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiation is happening right now. Uh, and we don't know whether something from this DNS filtering could be uh, secretly uh, brought in in this TPP mechanism, especially TTP has no transparency uh, to the public. Uh, they have to some businesses <laughs> available the negotiation documents to them. So this is for um, th what is happening in the legal framework, the international trend. Today, things we have the privilege from these very distinguished experts from different jurisdictions, probably we can talk a little bit about CCTLD and DNS filtering. Uh, that will be even more interesting. CCTLDs are very different from GTLDs. Uh, they are subject to the jurisdiction and laws and policies in their territory. This is very clear and is being confirmed by the GAC principle that's been set out um, uh, 10 years ago. So CCTLDs has always been running the TLDs in their territory subject to local uh, uh, rules 
and, and jurisdictions, even though there's some uh, special CCTLDs, it's just some open CCTLDs, and now we have IDN CCTLDs. But CCTLDs may have their own policies to address the problem of uh, DNS filtering. This is sometime, this is something we can compare exactly today. Well, if we talk about DNS filtering, it may not be bad things. It could exactly for very much legitimate and necessary purpose. It is to take down a phishing website. We want to take down this very timely. It is against a cyber crime. It is to prevent uh, a malware from spreading around the internet. These are very legitimate purpose, but the issue about substantive justice cannot just compromise the procedural justice. What we want to talk right here, right now, is the due process. Whether a CCTLD should make a policy to take down certain domain names, not only because of the strain is not appropriate, but also the contents communicated on this domain name websites is not appropriate. Uh, should a CCTLD do this? So I've, we have a few questions, probably of dear friends from different jurisdiction, um, from different CCTLD territory can kindly answer. Whether they are making this takedown, blocking, redirecting, stop resolution decision by themselves, or they are listening to the order from public authority such as they just follow the court order or administrative order. This is one question. It seems it's pretty important. Uh, are you doing this by yourself, or you just enforce the order of public authority? Um, a second question is that, are you following the administrative order or following the, the court order? This went through the tradition process. The third question is very critical, is about cross-border issue. Will a CCTLD manager listen to a foreign court order or foreign administrative or martial order to take down certain domain names, or even though they may be for very much important and necessary purpose to stop cybercrime immediately? The last but not least, this is a question for all of you to, c to think about. When we think about this kind of uh, enforcement through ISP to take down certain contents, block information on the internet, ISPs are actually subject to kind of uh, liability exemption or limitation uh, uh, mechanism. We call it safe harbors. So they take down something, they shouldn't be liable for this action. Are these CCTLD managers, their registry, enjoy the same level of safe harbor treatment, or they just expose themselves to legal liability. Think about they take down somebody else's domain name or stop resolving the domain name to the original de that destination. This kind of breach of contract. Where is the domain name holder? Uh, will they be uh, liable for damages? Uh, recently, uh, there is some enforcement uh, by one company that take down a hosting website. It just blocked the whole domain names, and the many other contents, very much legitimate, innocent contents, were blocked on the whole hosting services. This will cause tr tremendous damages. Uh, will that be a liability issue for all the CCTLD who take this measure to think about? You want to be safe, don't you? <laughs> So this is my short introduction and raise a couple of questions. I really do not have questions to them. Uh, I don't have answers to them, so I'm expecting answers from you. Um, shall we start from the very serious professor, Vivekanandan, in India? Yeah, thank you, Vivek. Yeah. You, 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 uh, yes, use that. So, so let me... Uh, begin since uh, Hong has given me the first lot to speak. I just wanted to a little bit brief about uh, censorship and uh, regulation uh, as a legal instrumentality. Uh, to differentiate, as I said, that censorship is basically suppression of speech or other public communication which may be considered objectionable, harmful, since 
insensitive or inconvenient as determined by government or it could be media outlets by themselves or by other controlling bodies. So that is also an engagement of self-censorship. So censorship is real and it has a long history and it will have a future history. On regulation, which seems to be a milder word compared to censorship, it is again mandated by state basically on various aspects, political or economic regulatory issues. And this can be in order to control risk of monopoly or for a public good or for inadequate information or unseen externalities. So this is another aspect. And there seems to be a very thin dividing line between regulation and censorship. And censorship seems to be at the extreme end and regulation seems to be operating somewhere on another end and the middle ground. So if you really look at uh, this topic, what we are discussing today, from an Indian context, uh, we do not have so far a specific policy or a specific act at the CCTLD level. It has been more from the ISP level. And that again, pre-2008, we had not much of occurrence, but after 2008, with a major attack in Mumbai uh, by the terrorists, which had an extensive use of internet as one part of planning, there was a huge outcry. And after 2008, you find, uh, you know, uh, a, a, what you call as takedown notices or blocking ISPs became an important part. India had its first Indian Information Technology Act in 2000. Uh, which was quite uh, uh, modeled after, you know, the uh, other, other countries' models, but it has been quite dormant. But after 2008 and 2009, you find a flurry of activities, and that culminated in 2011 with uh, uh, different fronts where they were trying to talk about the concerns in terms whether it's regulation or censorship. The first one I would like to uh, refer is... Uh, second is uh, basically what I call as the takedown notices which were issued to Google and Facebook. Google brought out in its transparency report of the increasing you know request or increasing order from the government to you know remove very many websites. Of course from the government side uh, the predominant argument was is basically concerned about a very religiously sensitive society and you all know that India has multiple religions and has a track record of a lot of uh, you know religious riots so they felt that this is the reason what they gave but uh, according to Google Trans uh, their own uh, report uh, the majority almost 80 percent of the sites which were asked to be removed were basically sites which were politically critical rather than sites of hate speech or other types of varieties. So this br brings us to the question that uh, how does this new guidelines in the IT Act really acts? So the question is, even though on paper you have quite a lot of checks and balance in terms of various secretaries to be consulted before such thing to be done, it on the ground it looks like the orders are much issued at a much lower level and probably there is no clear uh, no link between whether all these things were considered properly and these orders were issued. On the other side, you find the ISPs uh, rather overreaching uh, out of fear because they don't want their operations to be suspended or to get into certain litigation. So many a times it was brought to the notice that they have blocked entire websites instead of taking on certain URLs. And one of the major Indian telecom provider Airtel, which is also an ISP, uh, which holds a lot of internet traffic, has, uh, f has found to be, you know, uh, uh, misinterpreting certain court orders and putting it. So this is one front from the executive side. On the other side, you find an extra sensitive judiciary, which in my opinion probably has not got many of the nitty-gritty of internet properly, has quite often come out with judgments. And in fact, very interestingly, one judge in India said that don't allow us to go the way China goes, then we may have to block many things. So probably they were showing China as one example to tell that that is the right way to go was the kind of chilling effect which it had. But uh, luckily in the recent order about a couple of months back, uh, a high court in Madras finally came out and said that 
you cannot block entire websites and the responsibility would be with, with the ISPs and they need to really go only after the URLs. So if I'm going to uh, sum it up, uh, we are, if you look at the various reports of Freedom House or other types of agencies, India stands uh, around uh, 39 out of, the, out of the 100 countries what they are looking in terms of, uh, you know, freedom of, you know, internet, in terms of censorship, in terms of regulation. But it has slipped out heavily in the last few years to go to a lower order. And that is a matter of concern for very many people who are basically not against uh, legislations which has to be transparent, which has to have certain amount of accountability rather than knee-jerk reactions and procedures. So even though we don't have presently any CCTLD blocking or filtering thing happening at any significant level, the worry is that if this is not you know, properly addressed, probably the mood could be the next thing to make it much easier to go to the CCTLD level and then try to block things. I would like to stop at this point. Thank you so much, Professor Vivek. This is very informative and insightful uh, analysis of situation in India. Uh, we want to collect all the questions at the very end. Uh, so after Professor Vivek, uh, probably we, we proceed to Professor Chingmai. Yes, please. Thank you. Firstly, for the excellent introduction that frames the problem I felt in, in a in a very nuanced manner and to Professor Vivek also for explaining the context in India, the major concerns and the ways in which our government is dealing with some of them. I'm going to try and take this forward to address um, the introductory question of, of the sort of structures that we have in place right now and the kind of concerns that are likely to rise in the future and perhaps some ways in which we could think about addressing them. I hope that this framework will um, will make sense in the Indian context, and I'll give you examples as I go forward. So to start with, when I discuss the issue of, um, of filtering, I'm going to discuss it a little generally and not DNS specifically, because that's the way in which, as Professor Vivek explained, Indian policy works right now. I'm going to keep it values neutral so that everyone in this room more or less relates to this mechanism regardless of which country you're from. Different countries find different kinds of content objectionable, but whether it is copyright, whether it is pornography, or whether it is incitement to offense, every country has something that it usually wants to take down. So leaving that aside, um, there was this excellent paper by Derek Bambauer called, I don't know if, he, if I pronounced his name right, but it was called Cyber Seeds, and he came up with this values neutral mechanism to see whether, uh, in what manner states are conducting their blocking. And I think that this mechanism will be useful even when we're thinking of DNS-based blocking because it's a mechanism that's useful regardless of whether you think of state-directed filtering or uh, private parties directed filtering. So he had four elements to his mechanism. It was openness, transparency, narrowness, and accountability. And um, to begin with, so starting with openness, what did the Indian government do wrong as far as openness was concerned? Openness requires that when, that A, the state admits whenever it is censoring content, and B, it is a little, it is direct about the kinds of content that it is censoring. So for instance, in 2006, uh, India decided to take blogger offline because we were having a little, uh, one of our reasonably frequent skirmishes with Pakistan and they decided that the blogs are sort of uh, participating in this in, in an unpleasant way. So they did two things around 2005-2006. One is that they took down this excellent Pakistani newspaper called Dawn, which I was fond of reading, so I was not too happy about that. And two is that they were unhappy with certain blogs and they took down the whole of blogger. Um, now when they did that, if you typed, uh, and I had a blog at the time, so if I typed chinmayarun.blogspot.com, which doesn't exist anymore, um, I would just get to a page which implied that the site was not re reachable, that there was some sort of technical problem. It was not clear to me that the state was responsible for this particular form of filtration. I'm told that later on there was some sort of press release that suggested that pri private parties did it themselves. But we've had a lot of occasions in which the state has insisted that certain kinds of content become inaccessible in the country, but we're not told so when we click on the link. We think that there's there's a technical problem, and that's that's basically violating openness, and I cannot think of a good reason why a state would do that. 
I'm told interestingly that in Iran, I, um, I met a, an interesting gentleman from Iran who told me that yes, there's a lot more regulation of values-based regulation of content, but then when something is filtered, you know it's filtered. You get a page saying that no, you cannot go to the site and it gives you alternatives. So no, you cannot go to Facebook, but why don't you consider alternative social networks? So interestingly, that's open. Um, transparency is basically, now a state can say yes, we filter. These are the b bases on which we filter. But it, it may end up being a little unclear about what would fit within those categories and what wouldn't. So again, in our very diverse country, most people are offended very easily. So there's practically anything that you put up online is going to offend someone or the other, right? Now, the question that you ask is, wh when is it that you're overstepping the line? We're a democracy, we're allowed to criticize our government. When does it, when does it cross the line into sedition or into incitement? Um, these these categories as to what kind of content would be seen as fitting within within um, objectionable content or within offensive content the state needs to be as clear as possible with the public about these are the things we take down these are the things we don't and at the moment we don't exactly have have that either narrowness suggests that fine you come up with your list of uh, we filter obscenity anything that violates public order etc etc but then what you actually take do down has to has to correspond well firstly your categories have to be as narrow as possible and secondly what you actually take down has to correspond as far as possible to those categories right so you can't have these sort of uh, we will take down all content that is offensive right and then you don't know no one's clear about what is offensive and what is not so it has to be very specific about what you take down and one also has to make sure that in the actual practice of taking down one is neither over inclusive nor under inclusive example of over inclusive would be um, you say everything offensive will be taken down and then you say that anything that makes fun of politicians counts as offensive content and i'm sure that that's familiar to a lot of people under inclusive is that you have content that legitimately fits some of your categories so say pornography but some pornography is taken down and other pornography is not taken down now if pornography is so terrible that we need to censor it then why why would we expose some of our populace to some kinds of pornography and feel that that's not a problem, whereas we take down other kinds of pornography. So that's seen as problematic too in terms of what the state says and what the state does. And the final category is accountability, which I think is also we could really use in, in the Indian system, which is that uh, we've currently got a system by which people can can give notice and private, uh, private intermediary, intermediaries are usually expected to take down content. But there's really no possibility for someone to appeal against that. So for instance, if I have a blog up and somebody objects to it saying that, you know, I find it offensive and the intermediary decides that, look, it's too much trouble to go and litigate about this, let me just take it down. I, the blogger, or my one or two readers would not be able to appeal and say that, no, actually it doesn't fit within the categories described under the IT rules. That's one. And two, even in terms of general principles, there is no, um, there is no appeal process built in to this into the notice and take down process in India and, and that's problematic too so um, I believe that if we build all of this into our blocking and censorship systems it will become democratized in some measure I'm not taking a stand on I, I'm famous for having extremely liberal stances on what should be censored or not but I'm even without getting into that debate I feel like if if we wanted a procedure to be fairly legitimate and if we wanted it not to be abused this might be a good way to do it and to give you an example of the thing that that dr vivek talked about he mentioned how the google transparency report said that there was essentially over inclusiveness in terms of um censorship of content where we had a list of reasons that were given and we said that okay the child pornography is bad and uh, sedition is bad etc etc but the actual requests that were going to service providers from the government were all quite political right they were uh, they were basically censoring um, material about political figures differently private parties are also so this is sort of like if my neighbor say is a really is gets offended really easily right my neighbor could actually have quite a lot of content taken off the internet easily and cis actually did a study on this a person sent frivolous requests to a bunch of intermediaries to see what they would do and there have been occasions on which intermediaries have responded saying that look we don't think that this content can legitimately be taken down but we're taking it down anyway <laughs> so that's basically our framework right now and um, yeah and, and so if we add dns filtering to it i can only imagine where that would go thank you well, thank you for a very beautiful and young professor. This is very interesting and systematic analysis, uh, and especially the part of transparency. 
uh, we want to know what is being uh, blocked or filtered, and, and, and we shouldn't mistaken that for a technical problem. I guess that's very important in the DNS system. Okay, then we move on to our dear friend Andre. He's got a very clear answer to all the <laughs> questions already. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying to be uh, systematic and uh, will answer your questions in the, in the sequence. Um, yeah, first question was, do, do we as a CCTLD enforce the domain name blocking or taking it offline? No, we don't because um, we don't have a relations with registrants. We only have relations with uh, registrars. So it's their level, and they take down hundreds of domain names monthly. Uh, it's uh, our regular uh, daily work. There is nothing uh, special in this. Um, in our domain registration rules, um, it is said that uh, the registrars have the power of taking down the domain name if the domain name or the a resource addressed by this domain name is in violation of the certain uh, requirements. Uh, such as viruses, malware, phishing, uh, child porn. That's that's it. Uh, the rest of the takedown things goes uh, up to the state level and uh, executed by the state uh, orders. So, uh, and so far uh, with uh, this mechanism, which allows us to take down, allows our registrars to take down hundreds of domains. There is no, there was no single objection so far for the year. But there are tens of, uh, tens of domain names uh, returned uh, online uh, because uh, they cleaned up the bad code uh, on their resource. So it's also in the practice. Um, in total, if uh, we, we did some research, in, in total we consider that about 40,000 domain names in .ru are used for suspicious activity. But uh, guess what? We're not in a hurry because uh, we understand that um, they will move to other zones and disappear from our radar if we take down if we take down them immediately. So um, this is a very tricky situation because uh, this is like on a, on a sharp line of the certain legal questions and things, but uh, that's reality and we have to face it. I mean, there are some guys who are doing bad things in the internet and they use domain names for the bad things, okay? So, second question was, do you follow uh, administrative or court orders? No, we don't. <laughs> Registrars do. <laughs> it is important to know that uh, our hosting companies, ISPs and operators, uh, within the Russian legislation really, uh, without the legal field of Russian Federation, um, respond to the requests from the officials very fast and efficient. Um, um, if we take two parts of it, administrative and court orders, uh, actually there's, uh, there is a strong uh, description of what level of the administrative enforcement can be done. It's basically the high level uh, police bureaucrats to so the police uh, officers, um, which most of them known, uh, very few of them can do this order. And also the prosecutor. The prosecutor can send you a note saying, you know, please take this domain down. And again, we're talking about the cctld.ru, so we're talking about the national uh, cctld. Uh, so, okay, another question was uh, cross-border issues. Uh, what? how we deal with administrative or court orders so which we receive from the abroad. Uh, well, this leaves some space for the improvisation, of course, because um, there are common grounds, uh, child porn, you know, viruses and fraud, uh, drugs and weapon traffic. Um, and what we do, we send these orders to the fast track. That's what we call the fast track pass. Uh, we know some guys who, who can take care uh, of these issues very fast and efficient. Um, let me say it's very, very few uh, cases uh, for at least four years for my involvement in the domain business that we received uh, court orders or martial orders from the U.S., for example, uh, to take down certain domains. And guess what? When we receive it through the official channels, uh, usually this domain is already down. Somebody took care of them already. Okay, uh, and um, there is another interesting issue, uh, ISP blocking issues. Uh, 
damages. Uh, we, we call it the damages of the federal law 139. Uh, starting November 1st, uh, there is a new law in Russia which uh, gives, which uh, we, we call the blacklist law. The, 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 there is a list of bad resources and the ISPs when they uh, they have an access to this list and they have to block uh, block these resources. By the way, they have to block it by the URL or URI, not by the domain name or the IP address. But in the reality, very few ISPs and operators have uh, a mechanics, a heavy technology, which will allow uh, specifically target a certain URLs to be filtered. So uh, the providers they one take the risk, so usually they just block it by the IP and they just black out the whole segments of the internet. They don't care. They have an order, uh, and they have to uh, carry this risk uh, to losing the license, so uh, they, they, they do this nuclear weapon <laughs> in the internet. Uh, but um, should I, I should say that it's very rare. It's very rare, and, and it's um, usually do done on a regional, not very professional uh, level, like a local judge uh, makes uh, a decision to block a certain, uh, certain uh, movie on the YouTube send this order to a local provider, the local provider blocks the YouTube. There are very few cases. <laughs> and usually it causes very, very serious scandals, and it comes back online very fast. <laughs> um, and again, uh, this is the law number 139 uh, takes into consideration all the three categories of the content. It's the child sexual materials, uh, suicide, uh, uh, descriptions and drug uh, drug recipes and drug trafficking. So, uh, in general, there is no DNS filtering uh, in Russia. Uh, so far, I don't know such cases. We just take them down if they doing something bad. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Andre. This is a brilliant answer. It's very very clear. Um, thank you so much for clarifying that registrar can take down domain names according to registration agreements. Uh, we have deemed the, the breach of the provision uh, in, in the agreement. Of course, there's the general practices across all the CCTLDs. And um, um, thank you very much for talking about a fast track with respect to the foreign uh, well, the foreign communications uh, from the other jurisdictions. This is very, very interesting. Uh, okay, now um, why don't we move to Carlos? Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, Hong. And uh, I'll probably like uh, be very brief. Uh, not as organized as my Russian friend, and as I'm uh, not going through one question after the other. But let me let me start like very broad, dealing with uh, DNS, and then tackling some uh, some issues on filtering and the role of the ISPs, since my Indian colleagues were addressing this issue as well. So at first I would say, and uh, it's a pretty like a broad remark, that the DNS and specifically the CCTLDs, they certainly are key to the discussion of jurisdiction and rule of law in the internet. And this idea that the internet is a borderless uh, uh, region, land, this is all gone. And this is only useful nowadays to, 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 to sell smartphones on ads. And so we really need to understand how to address a situation in which you have the borders uh, pretty much uh, framed inside the CCTLDs as regions in which you have a national law applying to that piece of domain names and how can we compare and treat this kind of regulation in a globally distributed uh, resource, re resource infrastructure, I may say, as the internet, which is a major internet governance uh, question. But I'll leave that to Bertrand that I think that's probably one of the issues he, he's, going to, he's going to take. So on the handling of DNS in Brazil and the DNS uh, blocking slash uh, filtering, 
I really have to say, and this is uh, it's good to, to put this up, that I'm not speaking on behalf of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, even though we do a lot of research with the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. And the, the position, from what I understand, from CGIBR, from the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, is that they do not filter or block domain names and if they do that, it's only by a court order or by a judicial order requiring that. So there isn't, there isn't a situation in Brazil in which a law enforcement agent could request a domain name to be blocked and that would be, uh, that would be accepted by the current status of the, the way DNS is handled and CCCLD is handled by the CGIBR in Brazil. Having said that, I think it's important to highlight one situation here. The CGIBR has, uh, for more than two years now, been running this set of ten principles of uh, internet governance in Brazil. Maybe some of you guys here in the room have already heard about it. We have been talking about those ten principles of the CGIBR for a number of times in previous editions of the IGF. So if you happen to be in the flying circles of the IGF, there is a good chance that you have heard about it. And one of the principles for internet governance in, uh, in Brazil, in the CGIBR, is what we call, like in the absence of a better translation, we call it, that I'm saying in Portuguese, inimputabilidade da rede. And we translate that to unaccountability of the network. That's the official translation. But uh, I would simplify it. Uh, unaccountability of the network means, like, don't blame the Internet. Do not interfere with the one who is not the person responsible for the infringing activity. So the way the CGIBR explain this principle, that so-called unaccountability of the network, is all action taken against illicit activity on the network must be aimed at those directly responsible for such activities and not at the means of access and transport, always upholding the fundamental principles of freedom, privacy, and respect for human rights. So that's the explanation of this principle as set forth by the CGIBR. So this is the issue of DNS that bring us to uh, a specific issue in Brazil, which is uh, intermediaries liabilities slash filtering and blocking of content. So just to give you guys a, a highlight on that, those principles of the CGIBR, they were approved by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. But nowadays we have a process in Brazil to turn those principles into law. So we have what we have been calling the Civil Rights Framework Initiative in Brazil. Uh, in Portuguese, we call it Marco Civil. Marco probably doesn't mean much to you. It seems like the name of an uh, Italian actor or soccer player, but it's framework. So it's a civil framework for the Internet. So the, the idea behind this uh, civil rights framework is to really insert into Brazilian legislation fundamental principles and fundamental rights for further regulation of Internet. And of course, you have the usual suspects, free speech, privacy, net neutrality, they're all there. But when it comes to uh, filtering and blocking and ISP liability, we have now been facing a very interesting struggle and that's uh, my, my two final points on, on, the Brazilian, on the Brazilian scenario. So the first is, the, the Marco Civil, the Civil Rights Initiative, the Bill of Law that is now being discussed in the House of Representatives, as it is today, and by the way, let me just tell you, uh, this Bill of Law were, uh, was uh, in fact constructed, created by a collaborative process in which uh, people could just contribute to the actual wording of this legislation in a website, which was uh, something quite unique at the time. It was 2009 when we ended up starting this uh, process in Brazil. So this very collaborative process, it's now being discussed in the, in the National Congress as a bill of law, and we have this provision on ISP 
uh, liability. And the provision as it stands today says that uh, ISPs are not to be responsible by for the contents that third party upload at the internet except when they do not comply with a judicial order. So this wording is really uh, important here in this debate of filtering and blocking and the DNS because it sets forth the principle that a notice and take down or even a notice and notice uh, uh, process, it may happen, people can do do can notify uh, uh, a provider, an ISP, to take down some content. And if the provider agrees, he can take down this content. But he's not obliged to. He will only be obliged and, of course, responsible if they do not uh, carry on a judicial decision if they are requested to take down a content by a judicial order and they do not comply with it. Of course, there is a number of uh, groups that are pretty much not happy with this provision, and some of them are certainly come from the content industry, and most, uh, most spe specifically to the copyright industry, and that would take us to the comparison with SOAP and PIPA. We had a bill, uh, a bill of law in Brazil that was proposed in the Congress there was almost the exact translation of the SOPA and PIPA legislation that was proposed in the U.S. So we had our own SOPA and PIPA provision. The funny thing here is that the, the deputy that proposed the, the, this legislation, when he realized the huge criticism that SOPA and PIPA end up facing uh, worldwide, he took down his proposal saying, I'm a long-time champion of free speech, so I apologize for this mistake that I've made, and he retrieved, he took down his, his proposal. And I said I have like two last comments, so this first one is on the civil rights framework, and just to let you guys know, we would have a voting on this bill of law yesterday, and there is some disagreements on whether we would need a specific provision for copyright enforcement in the Marcos review. The voting of yesterday was postponed to next week when people will try to decide if this regime of ISPs not being responsible for third-party content unless they have a judicial order being brought against them. Of course, they want this safe harbor, the safeguard to, to ISPs not to be applied to copyrights. They want a specific copyright uh, provision for liability. And I want just to conclude telling you guys, if you have uh, curiosity and want to know a little bit more about the Brazilian scenario on internet regulation and internet policy, I would like to refer to you to this, uh, to this website that you can see there, but probably can read because uh, we at the Getulio Vargas Foundation, we are a research center in Sara Law School, together in partnership with the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, we are putting up uh, annual reports on Brazilian internet policy and we are just now preparing our report for 2012, but the report of 2011 is available in English. We are still tweaking some things on the translation, but just to let you guys know where to find it. So, Hong, if you excuse me, and this is going to be really, really quick. So, this is the, can you hear me? So, this is the website. It is uh, observatorio da internet dot br is a good that you can train your Portuguese. So uh, at this website you have this uh, section here, Internet Policy Report Brazil. So if you click on this in this link, it will take you to the report of 2011. It is in English and it could be a good window for people who want to know a little bit what's going on on internet policy in Brazil. And I would say this is not, a, uh, this is not meant to be a, a, a panel to discuss mood stakeholderism as it seems to be quite trendy in the IGF to 
discuss that in every single panel. But the report, of course, is written in a multi-stakeholder fashion, covering issues, interests that are related to non-commercial interests, commercial interests, technical community. So we're trying to, to, to make it as multi-stakeholder as possible. So uh, that was my remark. Sorry to have been a little bit longer than expected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, especially you mentioned the uh, .br in a governance principle. I know this is very much the pioneer principles in the whole world. Now there's many other principles uh, developed through other international and national agencies. It would be really good if we have the principles or across the world so we can have an easy reference what will not be uh, available on the internet, what has been blocked and what will not be blocked. Um, Thank you very much. We've learned uh, from the ladies and gentlemen from India, Russia, and Brazil. Uh, for the Chinese one, uh, Bertrand can kindly refer to the, my presentation made in Costa Rica. <laughs> right. I was not representing .cn. I was presenting as a civil society observer. So um, our Mr. Word, uh, any observation <laughs> and, and a holistic solution to this issue? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hong. This is a tall order. Um, a few, a few elements that um, I would like to look at these issues in a transversal manner. And most of those elements come from the work that we've been doing in the Internet Jurisdiction Project uh, since the beginning of this year. The first point I want to um, touch upon is the notion that whenever there is a use of the domain name system and actually the addressing system or the um, ISP role by a national government, there is a potential for transboundary and extraterritorial impact. And one thing that is very interesting, and it was uh, clearly triggered uh, in the case that you're probably familiar with in the U.S. called Roja Directa and the case of Bodog, where the ICE arm of the Homeland Security seized domain names that were respectively uh, used by Spanish uh, citizens and hosted in Spain or by Canadian citizens and hosted in Canada because those domain names were either had either been bought through a registrar based in the US, that was the case for Bodog, sorry, for Aurora Directa, or through a registry based in the US, that was the case for Bodog.com. The interesting thing with this is that it is, in a certain way, a perfectly understandable exercise of sovereignty as the uh, operators are based on the territory of the United States. However, when you think about it, it basically implies, if you spread the, um, uh, the notion, it basically implies that any website or any application that is under a .com, .org, .net, .tv, or any other TLD that is managed by a US-based operator the content and the activities of those websites and services should be in compliance with the U.S. law. This is a tremendous extension, extraterritorial extension of sovereignty, when you think about it, potentially. Let me be clear, this is not particularly specific to the uh, United States. And this is interesting in the case of CCTLDs, because as you know, CCTLDs are based on national territories have usually a close relationship with the government of their country. But the registrants can be in many other countries. And most, many of them are semi-open or broadly open. And I give you an example with the .ly a couple of, I think two years ago, before the revolution in Libya. The .ly TLD was very broadly used by American-based um, entities and places around the world because LY is a nice termination for many um, English names or English words. And I think a lot of people didn't realize that it was actually the CCTLD of Libya. 
And one website realized it uh, painfully because having posted on their uh, cover page a picture of a woman with just one bare shoulder in a, in a dress, the domain was taken down by the Libyan authorities because it was not in conformity with the Sharia law. So what I want to highlight here is that unless we want to go back to or to enforce a notion that we should only have CCTLDs that are for a given territory, for the citizen of that territory, and under the, the, the law of that territory, we are naturally going in a direction where countries have to be careful about how they exercise their sovereignty on the DNS operators that are based in their country. And in addition, I want to tell one thing. I'm telling regularly a message towards uh, a certain number of governments who say, I want to reaffirm my sovereignty on my territory and my operators, that if you push the notion of sovereignty too far without this sort of self-restraint and responsibility, you are actually tilting the balance in favor, obviously, of the country that has the most operators on its soil. And so when, for instance, uh, European uh, governments want to push this principle of the pure applicability of sovereignty, they do not often realize that it is actually handing over to the United States an excessive um, uh, capacity for extraterritorial impact. And so this notion of extraterritorial impact, when you touch the DNS, is also what triggered, among other things, the uh, principle of the Council of Europe of no transboundary harm and the responsibility of states when they exercise their sovereignty on the joint and common infrastructure of the Internet to avoid national measures that have a transboundary harm on the access and use of the Internet. It's a recommendation of the Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe adopted at the end of 2011. That being said, beyond the question of the extraterritorial extension of sovereignty, there's another element that was touched upon uh, in previous comments, is the, this notion that the logical layer, the naming and addressing system, should be fundamentally not used as a content control panel. And the question is, the internet is based on the separation of layers. Of course, you can, in certain cases, use uh, actions at that level in case of urgency or in case of threats to the stability of the, of the infrastructure. But the fundamental question is, how far can you tamper with the separation of layers without harming the very foundation of the uh, internet that made it operational. I'm not saying you cannot touch it. I'm not saying you cannot do anything at the level of the DNS or the ISPs or the IP addresses. But you have to do it very carefully to avoid unintended consequence that can be harm to the system as a whole or extraterritorial impact. And I'm very interested to hear the, uh, the formulation that the, the Brazilians have, uh, have explored. I don't know if it is the wording that is going to spread, because unaccountability is always a little bit <laughs> worrisome as a concept. But this notion that the logical layer is, is and should remain as neutral as possible is clearly, uh, is clearly important. The third thing I want to highlight is there has been a trend recently by the large platforms and uh, Twitter and Blogger, if I'm correct, have led this uh, trend to use both IP geolocation and um, switch to CCTLD addresses to organize this very delicate question of how do you make different accessibility rules to a given content. Because as you know, in many cases, if you're a platform, there is content that is very legally um, not accepted in one country and perfectly legal in another one. A uh, perfect example is I suppose people still consider that France is a democratic country. And uh, <laughs> we still have rules. <laughs> we still have rules 
that have very strong protections, like Germany, as, as a matter of fact, on Nazi uh, uh, propaganda or uh, things that are related to Nazi memorabilia that the United States doesn't have at all. You remember the famous Yahoo case a long, a long time ago, which was almost the first jurisdictional case. These distinctions are very legitimate. How, as a platform, do you discriminate with an appropriate procedure? And one of the solutions that people have explored, which may have unintended consequences, I'm not absolutely sure yet that it is the solution, is to say, by default, based on your IP location, you will be accessing our international site through the CCTL determination of this site. Like you are in Pakistan, you would access YouTube through a YouTube.Pakistan as a default with the appropriate legal content that is accessible in Pakistan. However, the big challenge is those platforms say the counterpart from this is that people in Pakistan or other countries should have the right to say that they choose another point of entry and they should have the possibility to basically change their virtual location by saying I want to access the global platform which is a notion that deals with cyber travel cyber travel is something that we don't discuss much particularly in the IGF but it is strongly connected to the use of VPNs. And one of the challenges that we see emerging is that there begins to be a growing awareness, not only on proxies and anonymizers, but on the trend by some governments to regulate the use of VPN and basically to prevent the notion of cyber travel. And I want to highlight the fact that in the, human, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is a provision that we never use, which is the right to leave your country and come back. There is a real question that says, beyond using trade legislation or trade principles to deal with blocking and so on, is there a sort of right to cyber travel? Is blocking the equivalent of an exit visa? I just want to throw those ideas because we need new mental frameworks. And this leads to, to um, uh, 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 one before last point. The question of openness that you, that you mentioned, I don't know if you're aware, uh, I don't have the code in mind, but there has been a proposal made in the IETF to create a special code for blocking things. Instead of the hash uh, uh, 404, not found, it would be another code that would explicitly say this is not accessible where you are because it has been blocked by the relevant authorities. Which leads me to a very important uh, notion that we have explored in a workshop um, in, at Stanford uh, at the beginning of September with the major platforms. We had um, Google, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Microsoft, Disney, Yahoo but also Electronic Frontier Foundation, CDT, and Privacy International. And one of the things that emerged extremely strongly is the notion of due process and interoperability of procedures to ensure that they are proportionate, correctly documented, transparent, and so on. This is something that we will explore more in detail this, this afternoon at, uh, at 4.30, so uh, I don't get into more detail. But what I want to, to highlight as a, um, uh, as a closing uh, element is beyond this notion of procedures, the notion of cyber travel and so on, the jurisdictional structure in cyberspace does not map one-on-one -on -one the physical geography. It is not completely disconnected from physical geography, but it is not a one-on-one -on -one mapping, particularly because there are overlapping jurisdiction. And one of the questions that I want to throw uh, here is the theme of the other workshop we do on Friday, which is what is the geography of cyberspace? And one of the possible things to explore is that the domain name system is actually potentially a map 
of cyberspace. Because as long as you are on the servers of Facebook.com, you're actually in part under the jurisdiction of the terms of service of Facebook and the ter digital cross-border territory that Facebook represents. However, as long as it is in Facebook.com, you also are somehow under the jurisdiction ultimately of the US for most of the activity, except if you access it through Europe where you get the jurisdiction of Ireland and so on. I just want to throw this as a, uh, as, as a way forward because this jurisdictional problem is one of the most delicate and we need to um, organize the co-management by the government, civil society and the private sector of those shared spaces that are all those services that are working cross-border. Thank you very much, uh, Bertrand. This is very interesting, especially the part of uh, cyber travel and restriction. Uh, if you really need a visa to go to uh, the traffic in another territory, so this is a very clear organization of the Internet. This is a segregation of the globally accessible uh, Internet uh, 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 traffic. Uh, this is uh, really against the spirit of Internet. The, the, in that case, it won't be Internet. It's only some intranet, uh, big intranet. Yeah. Yeah, may I make, I agree with you, however, I want to make a very important distinction. <clears throat> we had a tendency to always speak about the uh, borderless internet. I'm sorry, there is no such thing as a borderless internet. And I repeat, there is no such thing as a borderless internet. There is a borderless infrastructure, um, logical infrastructure, that is not geography based. But there are borders, there are jurisdictional borders on the internet. If you move from facebook.com to a link that goes to baidu.cn, I'm sorry, it's just like traveling in Schengen space. I move from France to, um, uh, to Belgium, there's no border visible, but I change jurisdiction. And we have a cross-border internet, we have cross-border spaces but there are jurisdictions. The question is, are you allowed to cross those borders or not? This is different. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I guess we, we should leave, save some time uh, for the people in the room to, to uh, have open discussion. Uh, but of course, I have to tell you, there's different from the Schengen visa. There's no visa at all. You cannot get through. <laughs> it's completely blocked. <laughs> okay, any question uh, 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 from the people right here? Uh, any question from the remote? Oh, yes, please. Uh, can we uh, just transfer the microphone to the gentleman uh, right here? Oh, this uh, microphone. Oh, yes, just close to you, please. Hello. Um, <coughs> I'm Martin Levy from Hurricane Electric. And um, the, the, the concept of cyber travel Bertrand talked about is, is fascinating. But it was only talked about from one side of the equation. And this is. Um, um, this is the other part of the story. When you talk about names and DNS, ultimately they can get converted to numbers. I live in the infrastructure world, as you know, and numbers are how we route, how we turn left and right and move from one place to another. But the point I want to, to, to add to, your, to the complexity of the story is that when you sit and use a, a, whether it be a search engine or a social media or a site that is, it has become international. And it has multiple invocations in different top level domains or its generic dot com environment. You may see uh, somebody traveling here, let's say from a country in Southeast Asia, may in fact actually by default uh, use a search engine ending in dot th or dot vn or dot um, um, whatever. Um, what's interesting is that the actual packets, when they're sitting here in Azerbaijan, are probably traveling to a server farm in the center of Europe that's very well connected. They're not traveling back to a, a, to a Vietnam or to a Thailand or to somewhere else. So that cyber travel is the, ver the name, but the physical aspect may well be a, a well-protected uh, data center built where it's both jurisdictionally good to build, but also where it's probably efficient to build. Yeah. And so there are two sides to that travel. 
when we convert the name to something, uh, to an actual number, um, you and travel on the internet along those wires, along that infrastructure, you actually may not end up in a jurisdiction that matches the name that you're at. Adds to the complexity of the argument that, you've, that you have given. Oh, thank you, Bertrand. Do you have a response yet? Yeah, it's, a, it's not a, actually a response. It's to embrace what you said and to even expand it a little bit further. One of the things that we are witnessing regarding the jurisdictional challenge is that it is not only that you have 190 uh, jurisdictions. It is not even that uh, you have sometimes sub-national uh, jurisdictional uh, decisions but that there are many layers because the criteria of competence, as you said, encompass, for instance, some criteria regarding the location of the user. But you can also have a decision that is based on the location of the server. And I don't even get into the debate that we had yesterday in one of the panels of what is the impact of cloud computing in not even knowing where the server is. It can be based on the country of incorporation of the operator or where their subsidiary are being based. It can be connected to the domain name that is being used. It can be connected to the registry that is actually uh, producing this domain name. And it can be also connected, potentially, as you said, Mark, on the actual routing that has been, that has been made and the um, uh, the physical uh, transportation. I give you a very uh, analogy that this cyber travel uh, can, can lead to is to distinguish what is applicable to the human person who is doing something and what is actually happening at the underlying level. You know as well as I do that an American citizen is not supposed to fly to Cuba. If however the same citizen goes to uh, Colombia and then takes a flight to Cuba, he can enter. In the case of the internet, what you uh, address is very important. Even if the IP number in the end is one IP number, you may travel through a different domain route or infrastructure route that has consequences in that regard. And uh, one of the principles of non-transboundary harm of the Council of Europe is also an implicit principle of non-tampering with transit traffic. So you have not only the neutrality of the layer, but also the responsibility of states not to do anything with the bits that travel through their territory and don't come up in their territory. Thank you very much. Other questions? Oh, yes, please. Uh, Sides. It's okay. Okay. This is uh, Faisal Hassan from ISOC Bangladesh. Uh, you might know that in Bangladesh, last two months, YouTube has been blocked, and the government has done that to stop violence, finding no other way because the company who keeps the content is not in our country, and they refuse to remove the content because it's not in their policy. Whether, but they ref, uh, they have done the same thing in other countries, but. Only for our country and many other countries, they have some limitations because they don't have an office or server or whatever. So don't you think that global companies have responsibilities in this case? Thank you. OK, is this a question for all the panelists? Whoever wants to reply. OK, so who would like to comment on this? Uh, well, this is exactly what we have. Oh, yes, yeah, that's wrong. Uh, no, you go ahead. If <laughs> oh, yeah, um, this question is an extremely important uh, question because, and I will use here an extremely loaded word, you know that in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights there are exceptions on the basis of public order. And to be frank on a personal basis, if I look at what happened with the Assam uh, fake images and videos, and as a former government official, 
I fully understand the desire and the responsibility of a government to take the appropriate measures to avoid either particular riot or fake uh, information. And of course, if it is somewhere else, it's a problem. What is at stake here, and it, again, I use it with great caution because I don't even know what the uh, consequences of using this word could be. But we have a challenge now, which is global public order. And the responsibility that the government in one country has, and the operators in that country, have to take maybe temporary urgent measures. Because they know it is going to trigger a cycle of violence or so, we don't have the rules, we don't have the procedures, we don't even have the space where they can discuss this. And it is a very, very difficult question because instead of talking about global governance in big terms, we're taking just a thin slice. How do you handle hate speech, which is legal in one place, not legal in another one, when what is at stake is human lives? So uh, I just want to throw this expression. We'll, we'll discuss that again uh, this afternoon in the framework uh, for cross-border platforms. But I can tell you that for platforms, they explain to you that they're really caught between a rock and a hard place because they want to be faithful to due process. They want to be faithful to their own values. And at the same time, they are receiving requests that they don't really know how to handle because they have to make a determination which is becoming closer and closer to what a judge does. And this is not what the platforms want to do. Carlos, it's a if I may just uh, jump in, and uh, of course this is uh, probably the crucial matter for the need for due process that we are now discussing uh, increasingly, I think, in, in internet governance forums. And to make just an additional comment to what Bertrand was saying, this is very tricky for companies, and especially I would say as bigger as a company gets in the world of the internet, closer it gets to performing some roles of maintaining public order, it will be crucial. And we are getting into a scenario in which if we do not have the standards, and, and I'm, I'm not saying rules here, because I'm, I'm not sure if that's a matter that needs to be essentially regulated, because not everything that happens to be new needs to require like a, a new legislation for that. But certainly that's probably, I, I would say, the most promising area for standards on the process that will be helpful to companies. And that's a situation in which, as then again, going through the mood stakeholder approach, uh, we have governments pretty much interesting, interested in that because they want to avoid riots and they want to uh, maintain the public order. We have companies being asked to perform public activities or, or maintaining like public order. This is something that you would not expect from someone who put up a website or a social network of some sort. Uh, civil society has a key role to play in this scenario because we have the human rights activists, we have the expertise on the, the borders of or the, or the, the, the extensions of uh, free speech on the internet. And I would just, just like to remind you all that the, the rapporteur, special rapporteur for freedom of expression in the United Nations, Frank Lahou, just, relieved, just uh, released his report uh, for this year, and the topic is hate speech. So this is uh, yeah. So this is something that we really need to pay attention. Last year, report from Frank, Frank Delahou was a report that was pretty much uh, based on uh, the openness of the internet. The report of this year is based is focusing on hate speech. So I would uh, invite you all to take a look in this document. It's uh, it's very well crafted, and certainly. Put would some, shed some light into this very, very tricky issue that we that that, that your question ended up raising to the to the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two minutes left. Uh, 
have no other questions. Uh, I would say uh, we are really entering into an interesting time and uh, facing a very uh, complicated issue is uh, intertwining the technology and law with territory and the borderless infrastructure and the network. And uh, uh, we've uh, just uh, entered into the very complicated relationship between the global business and the sovereign states. Hopefully, they all exercise the sovereignty very carefully, and let's move into a world with open internet and free flow of information. Let's join us to select all the panelists. They provide wonderful the food for our thought. Thank you. If I may take the opportunity, you have all received this in your bag. There's this workshop at uh, 4.30 in room two on frameworks for cross-border online communities and services. Room two at 4.30 where we'll, we'll dig deeper in this. And the second announcement is the other workshop that was supposed to take place tomorrow morning at 11 on the geography of cyberspace has been moved to the afternoon at two. Tomorrow, geography of cyberspace has been moved at 2. And if you don't have this flyer with you, come and ask me. I'll be happy to give it to you.